Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for all my brothers and sisters who are watching online right now, whether they're in a living room, in an office, or they're in an MRT, a bus, or just walking down the street as they are watching this broadcast. I pray the Word of God will just touch them very deeply. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by your Word. So I pray right now, Holy Spirit, be our teacher. Teach us, illuminate our minds, and speak to us very deeply. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone say, Amen and Amen. Over the past few weeks, we have been learning about following Jesus Christ in this devotion, especially in His love for prayer. Jesus was in a constant prayer mode. What was the secret to his prayer life? We have seen that it is Bible meditation. Through meditation, prayer becomes a conversation, a wonderful fellowship and communion with our Heavenly Father. This weekend, as we conclude our series, let's go back to the words of Jesus Christ in the Lord's Prayer. Jesus teaches us that number three, Prayer is confession. Prayer is confession. Jesus says that we must regularly bring our sins to God, who will freely forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 12. So even though we are saved and born again, and we are considered saints, nevertheless, we are not perfect. None of us is. We still fall into sin. The reformers used the Latin phrase, simo ustus et peccato. Simo ustus et peccato. Simultaneously righteous and sinner. That means, in and of ourselves, we are still sinners. But by our faith in Jesus Christ, whose righteousness is now imputed and transferred into our account, God considers us righteous. This is the heart of the gospel. This is the good news. Of course, while God has declared us righteous in Christ, He doesn't want us to remain sinful. He wants us to grow in holiness, to be holy just as He is holy. But as long as we are alive in this lifetime, we will still sin. When we come to 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15, and this is Paul's testimony, at the end of his life, at the tail end of his ministry, Paul says, verse 15, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Can you see that? Paul the apostle, the teacher of justification by faith, he acknowledged even as a very mature saint, in and of himself, he was still a sinner. He says, I am, present tense, I am the chief of all sinners. When we look at 1 John chapter 1, and John is writing to mature Christians of Ephesus in the Roman province of Asia. So he's writing to the Ephesian Christians, right? Christians. He says in verse 8 and verse 9, If we say we have no sin... We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Now, this is not sin conscious, consciousness. This is not guilt consciousness. This is living in the truth. Verse 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus calls us to a life of confession, to a life of repentance. In fact, habitual repentance, daily repentance, which is very necessary for healthy, holy living. You know, when Martin Luther nailed his 95 Theses to the door of the Wittenberg Church in 1517, the first statement he declared was this, when our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, Repent, He willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. The entire life of believers should be one of continuous repentance. In other words, we should seek God's forgiveness every day in prayer, if necessary, 
if necessary. In the last two and a half years, I often use the Ten Commandments as a daily MRI for my heart. And I have no doubt whatsoever that Jesus Christ himself used the Ten Commandments in his own daily meditation. Now, for sure, the Ten Commandments cannot save us. We are saved only by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Hallelujah. But the Ten Commandments are very, very useful for the purpose of showing us if we have sinned, where we have sinned, when we have sinned, so that we can bring it to God in prayer. So this is how it works. As I did my prayer time two and a half years in a very difficult place, every day or very often, I bring my, my heart before God and I put it through the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. So I'll say, Lord, is there anything, is there anyone that I have placed above you? Father, forgive me. No one, nothing must be before you. I check deep in my heart, my career, my ministry, my family, my future, my very life. Is there anything that is even higher than God? If there is, then I pray, Father, please forgive me. Please forgive me. I seek your kingdom and your righteousness first. The second commandment, you shall not make for yourself any graven image. Have you ever wondered what is the difference between the first and second commandment? Because at face value, they look very similar, right? But think about it. Images have to do with our imagination. So whatever, whoever captures our mind, or is the constant preoccupation of our mind. Anything that is above God in our thoughts is a graven image. Maybe it's a worry. It's a constant fear you cannot shake away from. It is a work pressure, or it's an anger issue, or relationship problems. You cannot concentrate or focus on anything else. You can't even think about God and fix your eyes on Jesus because it is going through your mind all the time. Worry, worry, fear, fear, fear. You can't even live in the present anymore. If there is, then I pray, Father, please forgive me. Renew my mind. Don't let any thought or any imagination take your place. Help me, Lord, to fix my eyes on you. Then I go on to the third commandment. You shall not take the name of God in vain. Have I made any vows or any promises in the Lord, before the Lord, that I'm no longer keeping? The fourth commandment, keep the Sabbath day holy. Have I given time or have I, have I take the time to fellowship, to enjoy, to converse with God this week, these few days? Or have I been so busy and distracted by many things that I have forgotten to commune with God. The fifth commandment, honour your father and your mother. Have I been showing respect to them? Have I been honouring and giving to my parents? The sixth commandment, you shall not murder. Remember what Jesus teaches? Murder is not just the act. It is the anger that we entertain and hold on in our minds, in our hearts. So I check my heart. I check my life. It's a spiritual MRI. Have I been resentful? Have I been irritable of late? Have I been hostile and bitter towards people or sulky in my attitude? Have I been spiteful and unkind with my words? The seventh commandment, you shall not commit adultery. Again, right? Have I given in too easily to temptations in my mind, in my heart, to passions and desires? They're not really moral. Then commandments number eight, number nine, number ten. You shall not steal. You shall not lie. You shall not covet. I have to check my heart. I have to check my heart. Have I not been truthful in my words? Have I over-exaggerated? Have I not been really factual? Are there greed and covetousness inside me? You know, I humble myself and bring my sins before God. And I ask God for His forgiveness allowing Jesus' blood to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. So for two and a half years, 
I meditated on the Ten Commandments over and over again, as often as the Lord will lead me. And each time when I asked the Heavenly Father to forgive me my sins, my conscience got a good spiritual scrub. You know, the Holy Spirit sanitized my heart like hand sanitizers that we use these days in this season to protect our hands from germs and viruses. The Spirit of the living God sanitized my heart to help me walk daily in a constant atmosphere of holiness. And by God's grace, I could do that, walking with an awareness of the holiness of God and walking by His grace in, in the spirit of holiness at a place where sins and sinners abounded. Thank God for His Word. Thank God for the Ten Commandments. Thank God for His grace. You know, I, and, and that's how I, I learned to pray a long, long time. Maybe I got a lot of sins to confess. Maybe there are areas in my life I need to bring before the Lord. And I just enjoy it. It's like taking a long spiritual shower. You see, repentance is the way we remove filth and rubbish from our lives. Without repentance, real spiritual growth cannot happen. So we must develop the conscious habit of confessing our sins as often as we need to, which is why our Lord Jesus Christ included it in the Lord's Prayer. As we repent, we will grow in Christ-likeness. We will grow in our moral purity. We are no longer just seeking God's kingdom blessing. We are seeking His righteousness. We are living a life that is righteous and pleasing to Him. Now, Jesus also wants us to forgive those who have sinned against us. Remember Matthew 6, 21, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. That means those who have hurt us, offended us, wounded us. Now, this doesn't mean that forgiving others is the work that we do or the price that we pay to earn God's forgiveness. You never need to earn the forgiveness of God, of God or to earn your salvation. No, 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 no. Forgiving others, rather, is the clear evidence that we have truly repented of all our sins. And we are just imitating Jesus, following Jesus. Because on the cross, Jesus Christ himself was praying for his enemies, forgiving them, blessing them. This is a big part of who He is. No one loves more than Jesus does because no one forgives more than He does. Love and forgiveness are two sides of the same coin. You can never be a loving person without being forgiving. Sometimes, we don't want to forgive because we are afraid to get hurt again. Oh, pastor, I don't want to open up and be vulnerable to more hurts. But what we don't realize is that we are hurting ourselves by holding on to offenses. Doctors today are telling us that anger and resentment give us stress. Unforgiveness affects our immune system, give us headaches, neck aches, back aches, stomach aches. Unforgiveness give us insomnia, give us anxiety. Unforgiveness gives us high blood pressure, heart attacks, and strokes. So friends, why hold on to it? Unforgiveness really is the choice not to suffer. We forgive for our own good. Sometimes the person that we forgive might not even care about it. Huh? You want to forgive me? Hey, I don't even think I've done anything wrong. In fact, you deserve it. You had it coming. The truth is, Sometimes people can be mean and nasty. But we still have to forgive, not for their sake, but for our own sake. Because we have first been forgiven by God. There is no such thing as not being able to forgive. People who say that really mean, I choose not to forgive. Because forgiveness is a choice. You can have a choice to grow bitter or to be better. To be like Jesus or not. So friends, 
my brother, my sister, who is watching right now, will you decide to be like Jesus today? Choose forgiveness. Choose love. Choose peace. Walk in a constant atmosphere of forgiveness. Not only will you feel better mentally, emotionally, and physically, you will grow spiritually inside to be more and more Jesus-like, to have more and more Christ-likeness. Hallelujah. Choose forgiveness right now. Number four, prayer is petition. Prayer is petition. In the Lord's Prayer, Jesus teaches us to boldly ask God to give us this day our daily bread. Matthew 6 verse 11. So in prayer, you must learn to ask. Make your petition known. We mustn't think there's no need to ask anything from God because He already knows what we need. Sometimes we develop a wrong religious idea that we shouldn't ask from God. That is not how Jesus teaches us. You see, John chapter 16 and verse 24, and this is Jesus again teaching us about prayer. John 16 verse 24, Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive that your joy may be full. Now, Jesus never say, Oh, you don't need to ask. God, your heavenly Father, already knows everything you need. No, He said, you ask so that you could receive, so that your joy may be full. Let me tell you, we serve a wonderful heavenly Father. Our heavenly Father enjoys, He literally enjoys giving gifts to His children. He wants to give you salvation, healing, deliverance. He wants to give you blessing after blessing and wisdom. And He wants to give you the Holy Spirit and His anointing. But Jesus says, when we ask, we must ask in His name. How should we ask? In His name. What does that mean, in the name of Jesus? A person's name speaks of who he is and what he does. So whatever we pray for must be in line with Jesus' character, with who He is, and His finished work on the cross, what He has done. So we know this. Jesus loves to save. He loves to heal, to deliver. That is His nature. That is His character. And also, saving, healing, and deliverance are in line with the work that He has done on the cross. We are in the season of Lent right now. We are celebrating Jesus for His finished work for us on the cross of Calvary. So we must boldly ask Him to save us, to heal us, and to deliver us because it's in line with nature and what He has done. It's in the name of Jesus. But Jesus Christ is also the Holy Son of God. So we can never ask Him to satisfy any holy cravings or passions. Why? It's not in line with His nature. It's not in line with His character. So if your prayer is to satisfy your own greed, your own lust, your own ambition and dreams, or you need to prove a point to someone that you're bitter with, that you are better at, at the person, you're stronger, God won't answer it. You see, He looks at the motivations of our heart. James chapter 4 and verse 3 very clearly says this, You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your own pleasures. So everything we ask God for must eventually bring Him glory. So when you pray, you must be honest with yourself. It's what you're asking for ultimately for His glory or for your glory. Now next, asking in Jesus' name also means praying boldly in His authority. Whatever God has promised us in His Word, you can boldly, you must boldly, confidently ask Him for it. If you can find it in the Bible, then you know with absolute certainty that you are praying according to His will. 
John, uh, 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 to verse 15 tells us that. We pray according to His will. So simply asking God will not guarantee you answers to prayer. You must ask in faith. You must ask in confidence and boldness. That's how Jesus has taught us. Matthew chapter 21, verse 22. Jesus teaching us here concerning prayer. Whatever things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. So just simply praying is not enough. You must believe. You must believe. You must have faith. For without faith, it's impossible to please God. Oh, I love teaching and preaching about faith. So when you pray, first of all, you must ask according to God's will. Then you must ask in bold faith. And there's one more thing. You must ask persistently. When it comes to prayer, Jesus says, you must be persistent. You must persevere. Oh, my brother, my sister, you got to persevere. I can never emphasize that enough. In Luke chapter 11, and Jesus is teaching on prayer again. I mean, isn't it amazing? You find Jesus always praying, always staying in a prayer mode, and he's always teaching people, his disciples especially, that uh, that how they need to pray and how to pray. So it's very important. And, and here, Jesus is teaching on prayer again. And the Greek tense he's, he's using is very, very important. So let's look. Luke chapter 11 and verse 9. Jesus speaking. So I say to you, ask and keep on asking and it will be given to you. Seek and keep on seeking and you will find. Knock and keep on knocking, and it will be open to you. The Greek tense is given in the present continuous tense. So you've got to keep on doing it in perseverance, in persistence. So you cannot just pray once. You must keep on praying and praying, asking, seeking, knocking, asking, seeking, knocking, praying, praying, and praying until the answers come. A few chapters later, Jesus taught on prayer again. You see, he's always teaching us how to pray. In Luke chapter 18, he says that our heavenly Father expects his children to press him hard with persistence when we bring our needs to him. So this is totally not even like, you know, the idea like, don't ask because God your Father already knows. He said, no, you must ask. And you got to press him hard with persistence. And, and God the Father, He loves it. So Luke 18 and verse 1, look at it, it's amazing. Then He, that's Jesus, spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. So you must always pray. Persistence, right? Perseverance. Jesus then told the parable of the widow about a woman who repeatedly asked and asked and asked again asking the judge to avenge her in, in justice, asking the judge to fight for her. And then Jesus gives us the moral of this parable in verse, eight, uh, verse 7 and verse 8. And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Now, it's not rocket science. Just a plain reading of Jesus' words. You can see Jesus in his own words, crying out day and night equals faith. In his own words. Persistence in prayer equals faith. So when we ask God a second time, a third time, a fourth time, a fifth time, a tenth time, a hundredth time. It is not unbelief. To Jesus Christ, it is a demonstration of faith in God. And faith pleases God. Now there's one more thing, one very important thing. Sometimes people ask the question, if I pray for a healing, am I not coming against the sovereignty of God? Pastor, if I pray for a miracle, 
Am I not coming against God's sovereignty? I want you to have this assurance. The answer is absolutely not. No, no, no. A hundred million times no. Because God in His sovereignty has foreordained prayer as the means to bring His sovereign will to pass. Prayer is part of God's sovereign will for all our lives. See, in the gospel, in the four gospels, Jesus healed sick people and even raised the dead. And he didn't once consider that as going against the sovereignty of his heavenly father. I mean, can you imagine? Somebody died. Of course, when someone died, we always say, his time is up, right? I mean, it is God's will for him to go, go up to heaven or, or for his life to come to an end. But Jesus went and raised the dead. Jesus was not confused and said, oh man, should I pray, not pray? Is this against God's sovereign will? And can you imagine? Jesus healed the sick, cleansed the leper, raised the dead, did signs and wonders and miracles. And then he said, we are to do even greater works than he did. The fact is this. He sent out his disciples to pray for healings and miracles. And he has commissioned us to do the same. You that are watching, you are to do the same and even greater works. So we must pray in faith for signs and wonders to happen in our cell group, in our ministry, in our marketplace ministry, as we meet people, as we visit our, our friends and our relatives in the hospital. We must fully believe in God's willingness to heal the sick. But what about His sovereignty? What about His sovereignty? Yes, we must always allow God to have the final say on who will receive a miracle and when and how they will receive it. Let me give you an example. So this is how it works, all right? Let me tell you how pastor would pray for somebody, say with cancer, say with stage 4 terminal cancer. First of all, I don't doubt in my mind that healing is God's will for him or for her. I will visualize the person being healed of cancer. And I will believe with all my heart that he or she will be healed today when I pray or every day until the healing fully comes. And I will boldly pray and proclaim and confess that the Bible promises concealing healing will work for this brother or this sister. By his stripes, you are healed. In Jesus' name, rise and be healed. And I will also encourage the person to daily meditate on the many Bible promises concerning healing. But one thing I will not do. I won't guarantee, and I can't guarantee, that in 24 hours, in three days, in one week, one month, one year, the cancer will be completely gone. I can't guarantee that. Neither will I tell the person to stop his or her medical treatment. Why? I am not God. I am not a doctor. And in fact, healing and miracles are God's prerogatives, not mine. So we are only commanded to always pray and always believe, trusting God fully for His perfect will to be done in our lives. Now, if we don't get healed in this lifetime, we certainly will be healed in the next when we stand before God in heaven. Hallelujah. When we go to heaven, there is no more sicknesses. There is no more diseases. There is no more cancer, stroke, paralysis, uh, disability of any shape, form, or fashion. So, as long as we don't try to play God and presumptuously promise or guarantee people healings and blessings, we will never trample on His sovereignty. In fact, the converse is true. If we refuse to believe God for healing and pray for people for miracles, we are willfully disobeying a very clear and direct command from Jesus Christ. We are to pray that Jesus' name prevails. Why? Because healing, it is nature. Healing is part of the finished work of the cross. In my name, Jesus says, 
You will lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Hallelujah. So those of you who are watching, go ahead and offer bold, believing prayers for the sick. Then trust God to decide the best outcome for their lives. You will never go wrong when you have this humble attitude. Lord, I pray my best, and I trust you for the rest. God, I will believe you to the very last breath. My job is to believe and to pray to the very end. And I trust that your perfect will will be done. Your kingdom will come. Healing is your prerogative, not my prerogative. Amen. Finally, number five, prayer is adoration. Prayer is adoration. And this is my main point today. Jesus teaches that we must saturate our prayer with adoration. The Lord's Prayer begins with, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And then it ends with, Yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. You see, it, be, it, it begins with, with adoration. It ends with adoration. All prayers must be filled and saturated with thanksgiving, praise, and worship. Now, the Bible tells us that we must pray and seek the face of God. But God is so holy. The Bible also says, no one can see his face and live. Exodus 33, verse 20. So, we are supposed to seek his face, but yet, we can't see His face, not in this lifetime. How are we going to bridge this gap? Thank God. Through Jesus Christ, we can now have a nearness to Him that was not possible before. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, if you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6, For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So yes, we can have glimpses of the glory. We can have revelation of the glory of God, but it's only through and in the face of Jesus Christ. You know, one day in heaven, we will all have direct sight to the glory of God. With our literal eyes, we will see God in the fullness of His glory. Hallelujah. What a day of rejoicing that would be when we see Him for who He really, really is in the fullness of that glory. But until that day comes, we'll see God's glory, but like in a mirror, by faith. Not, not very clearly. We have glimpses here and there. By faith, we'll see it. We'll see God's glory as we read and learn about Jesus in the Bible. Meditate on Jesus. Worship Jesus. Adore Jesus. That's why we love that song. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Christ the Lord. What does it mean to adore? To adore a person is to deeply love the person for who he or she is. To be in awe of that person. So to adore Jesus is to clearly see how beautiful Jesus is in himself. Not because of what he has done, not because of what he's going to do, not because of our needs, but how beautiful Jesus is in himself. It is to be in awe of the beauty of his purity, to be in awe of the beauty of his devotion, of his love, his obedience, his humility, to be in awe of Jesus' power and faith and suffering. This beauty of Jesus Christ must capture our imagination, must dominate our waking thoughts, and fill our hearts with desires for Him. Remember, whatever captures our thoughts and imagination will rule our lives. If we can only fill our minds in our hearts, with the beauty of Christ, with the beauty of Jesus, we will experience supernatural rest, supernatural joy, 
And inner peace, we can have the peace that the world will not understand. We will become less anxious, less stressed out, and more courageous to go through every single day. You know why? We are living with the Lord and for the Lord. It is this inner joy and inner peace that will transform our soul. So prayer cannot merely be coming to God for His blessing. Oh God, you must bless me. God, you, your favor, favor must be upon me. Oh God, you know. It cannot just be going through lists and lists of requests after requests after requests after requests. We must be attracted to God for who He is. Prayer is a time of adoration. Simply enjoying God. Fixing our minds on heavenly, heavenly things. On the things of God. Not just what we can get from Him. Or even do for Him. Not just, you know, it's good to pray for revival. I'm a revivalist. I believe in revival. But sometimes it can be so fixated. Oh God, give us revival. Give us revival. That we don't enjoy the beauty of His holiness. You've got to enjoy God. Enjoy Jesus. We must be satisfied by the sweetness of His love. We must delight in His goodness, in His greatness. Prayer is worshipping and adoring Jesus until His glory breaks forth like a dawn in our soul. That's Isaiah 58 and verse 8. Again, this is where the Bible really helps us because this is a book of adoration. I'll give you one example. When Mary worshipped God, remember when he realized, or when she realized that she was going to bear the Son of God in her womb? Mary says, My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Luke chapter 1. So Mary really prayed all, prayed all that, but she was not speaking off the top of her head. Every word she used was a reference to Scripture. She was referring to scriptures from Genesis, from Exodus, from the book of Psalms, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, the book of Micah, the book of Malachi. She was praising and worshipping God with scripture after scripture after scripture. I mean, that's mind-blowing. For a young 14-year-old girl who, with limited life experiences, Mary prayed a powerful, a very powerful prayer of adoration. How? She prayed from the Bible. When you think about it, the vocabulary of Scripture is simply beautiful. I mean, phrases like, from the end of the earth, I cry out to you when my heart is overwhelmed. Oh, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Psalm 61, verse 2. Oh, we extol the name of Him who rides the heaven. He is our God. He is our God. Psalm 68, verse 4. I mean, the entire Bible is written with a spiritual vocabulary of heaven. And when we learn to speak the language of heaven, it makes our prayer fresh, powerful. It makes our praise and worship so very exciting. Our words are no longer empty words. Our words are spirit and life because they, they, they come out from the Word of God. And because this Word of God goes so deeply into our soul, into our spirit, so deep inside us, when it comes out of our mouths, it expresses the deepest thoughts in the feelings of our heart. Even when we are in pain. You know, sometimes the pain is so real and so deep, it's excruciating. We just don't know how to say it. We, we don't even know how to utter it. But the Bible shows us how to express our frustration to God 
so that we can have an emotional release and experience His healing, so that we don't have suppressed feelings bottled up on the inside and hurt us and wound us. Let me give an example here. Psalm 73 is a prayer of a psalmist who was angry. Let me rephrase that. He was very angry. He was so angry, he was on the verge of depression or maybe even ending his life because of the injustice and the unfairness he has suffered in the world. Friends, the truth is this. The world can sometimes be very unfair. The world can be very vexing. Living life can be a long frustration. Every day can be so painful. Psalms 73, in verse 16, he says, this life, it was too painful for me. Too painful. Verse 21, thus my heart was grief. I was vexed in my mind. He said, just thinking about life. I don't feel like continuing. It just vexed me. It just vexed me to the max. But then verse 25 and 26, he cried out, But whom have I in heaven but you? There's none upon the earth I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart, they fail. But God, you're the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Beautiful, isn't it? The Bible teaches us how to balance anger with love, disappointment with hope, so that we can fully and honestly express our anger and frustration to God and at the same time receive healing from Him, receive courage in our hearts. This is the power of the Word. This is the secret of Bible meditation. One final scripture and then we'll end our service, okay? Psalms 22, verses 1 to 3. And this is a picture of how Jesus Christ himself dealt with his own frustration. See, Jesus identified himself fully with us. And he went through pain that no human being has ever experienced. And Jesus cried out to God, Psalm 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Can you remember Jesus prayed this prayer on the cross? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? From the words of my groanings, oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear in the night season and am not silent. So Jesus he expressed feelings that's, that's found in Psalms. And Jesus used that because it helped him. God, I cry out. It seems like you're deaf to me. God, it seems like you're so far. God, have you walked away from my life? Where are you, God, when I cry out to you? My God, my God. You see, Jesus cried out like this. And then in verse 3, Jesus meditated. And he would have used this phrase, but you are holy enthroned in the praises of Israel. God, when I don't understand, Father, when I can't see your hands, I trust your heart. I will still praise you and offer the sacrifice of praise. Psalms 22, a constant meditation of Jesus Christ. And I have no doubt, in the most painful moment of his life, on the cross, Jesus cried out, Father, it's so painful, but yet I will still praise you, for you inhabit the praises of your people. I offer to you the sacrifice of praise. Whew. There's our Jesus. When we enter into adoration during our prayer time, worshipping with the words of Scripture, our feelings are purified by God's emotions. So we will never have bitterness. We will never have um, resentment. We will never have unresolved anger. Because yes, we are angry. Yes, we are upset. We are frustrated. But we allow God's feelings and emotions to wash through our feelings. And it will bring love and forgiveness. 
It will always bring healing. It will bring humility. It will bring inner peace and joy into our soul. And this is the power of adoration in prayer. This is all the time we have for this service. Let us learn to pray like Jesus. He teaches us that the secret of prayer is Bible meditation. Number one, which will bring us into number two, a confession with God. And in number three, in prayer, there must always be confession. And number four, let us be very bold and full of faith and confidence in our petition. And number five, please don't forget to saturate and fill your prayer with adoration in thanksgiving and praise and worship. Always focusing on the beauty of Jesus, on the love of Jesus, on the width of Jesus' love, the length of His love for you, the depth of His love. Friends, when you cry, Jesus weeps with you. He weeps with you. When you are happy, He rejoices with you. He feels the pain that you feel. You must experience the depth of His love and the height of His love. Jesus is not like the human love we receive. His love is totally unselfish. His love has no condition to it. Hallelujah. Before we end, let's just take some time to worship Jesus and to adore Jesus today. Let's just worship Him. And all creative things Above all wisdom And all the ways of men You were here before the world began Above all kingdoms Above all thrones Above all wise God is here right now. Today we've learned three important things that we must do when we come before the presence of God, when we come to a time of prayer. And the first one is confession. Why don't we just take this moment, wherever you're at, in your living room, in a bus, in an MRT, in an office, walking down the street, let's just confess our sins before God. Jesus is a holy Jesus. He's a loving Jesus but He's also a holy Jesus. And He says every single day when we come before the Lord, this is how we should pray. Father, forgive us our debts. Father, forgive us our sins. Let's just focus on the Ten Commandments. Commandment number one, you shall not have any other gods before Him. Is there anyone or anything in your life right now you have placed above God? Sometimes a dream, a vision, an ambition can be above God in our lives. Sometimes it could be worries. Sometimes it could be fears. Something that we place above God. Sometimes it could be, I don't know, the wealth of this world. Maybe it's our career, our ministry. I know even for my life, I've got to check and say, Lord, I don't want to put my ministry before you. Sometimes we're so busy with so many things that we have no more time for God. If 
that's an area you need to surrender to the Lord, make sure you can tell Him today, Father, forgive me, because there's no one before you. There's nothing that's above you. Could it be an imagination, a preoccupation in your mind? That's commandment number two. Something that captures and preoccupies your mind. Surrender it to God. What about commandment number three? Could it be that some promises that you have made with the Lord, in the name of the Lord, that you're not keeping, you're not faithful to keep? Could it be commandment number four? That you're so busy, you have, for, you have forgotten to put, one, put time aside to have a Sabbath moment with God, to keep it holy so that you're able to enjoy God, to worship Him, to adore Him in the beauty of holiness. Bring it to Jesus right now. Just confess your sin right now. He's here. He loves you. He's not here to condemn you. He just wants to scrub your conscience clean, wash that sin away so that there's nothing that will stand between you and God. What about the rest of the commandments? Honoring our parents, not entertaining anger and resentment in our hearts. What about in the area of our thought lives? You know, maybe in the area of uh, immoral imagination, of lust, of unclean thoughts. What about in the area of taking things that are not yours, not being honest, or lying? or in the area of covetousness or greed, envy and jealousy, whether is it a big sin or just a tiny sin, let's just bring it all to Jesus. Because if we are faithful and just, He will cleanse us from all our sins. Stretch out your hands to God right now. Surrender it all to Him. Father, I just pray for my brother, for my sister that's watching this service right now. Father, we surrender all our sins before Him. There's no one besides you. There's no one above you. Jesus, we surrender all to you. Forgive us. Forgive us from the guttermost to the uttermost. Forgive us from all our sins, we pray. Wash it with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Father, we humble ourselves. Lord, if we cherish sin in our heart, the Bible says you will not hear us. We want nothing to stand in the way of our communion with you. Cleanse us and wash us clean. Jesus, we adore you. Jesus, we love you. Jesus, we worship you. Jesus, you are so holy. Jesus, you are so beautiful. 